Hope Singapore, good morning. To our friends watching our broadcast, North East Centre, wherever you are, a good, good morning. We are on this Matters of Life series. If things matter to you, it matters to God. And if things are important to you, the Scripture would have given us an answer to the things that we are seeking and asking for. Now, two weeks ago, we were seeking about this aspect about divine wisdom. We have a God that has a higher order of wisdom, but this wisdom is within your grasp. This wisdom is for us to ask God for, but more importantly, as we ask God for wisdom, we need to obey and then act on it. And last week, Pastor Dennis preached about contentment in life. Have you ever wondered the things that you always wanted, when you have it, you'll be happy, you'll be contented? But apparently not. Contentment is a hard condition that wherever you are, whatever you have, that you find joy and pleasure with it all. This morning, we're going to talk about expectations. Expectations, expectations, expectations. We all have our expectations, don't we? So we'll be asking, you know, this morning, I was expecting a good-looking preacher to be preaching. (laughs) But truth be told, oh gosh, fall short of expectation. But my friends, I'm going to narrow the scope for us this morning. We're going to talk about expectations at work. Why? We spend so much of our time at work and this aspect of our work either brings up our expectation or causes us to have very low expectation. Well, I tell you why. We have expectations of our boss, how they should treat us. We have expectation on ourselves, how we are to perform on the job. We have expectations on rewards, remunerations, and promotions. Expectations, expectations, expectations. A story was told, a man on a hot air balloon, high up in the air, but then he was lost. He made a promise to meet his friend, and that was one hour ago. Now that he's lost, he's got to find his way around. So he saw a woman below, lowered the balloon and shouted at the woman. He says, ma'am, I need your help. Could you tell me where I am? The woman looked up five meters and then she told her this. Well, my friend, you are five meters high up above me. You are between 41 and 42 degrees north latitude and you're also between 56 and 9 degrees west longitude. The balloonist looked at the woman and said, you must be an engineer. The woman looked up, yes, how did you know? And then the man said, you know, the information that you give to me is technically correct, but I do not know what to do with it. It is not helpful at all. Now that I've spoken to you, it is a waste of time, I am delayed, and it's of no use speaking to you. Well, the woman looked up, ah, my friend, you must be from management. (laughs) The balloonist said, how do you know? Well, the woman said, you are high up there because of the hot air. (laughs) You made a promise you couldn't deliver. And now that things do not turn out, you blame me for your problems. (laughs) Expectations, expectations, expectations. We have expectations on our boss, how our boss should treat us. We have expectations on ourselves, how we should perform on the job. We have expectations on reward, promotion, remuneration. And my friend, this morning we're going to look at a scripture from Colossians chapter 3, verse 22 to 24. And we look to the unchanging God, the unchanging principles from the Word of God and how we can deal with our expectations at work and how to be secure and assured when it doesn't fall through. Could you turn to your Bible to Colossians chapter 3, verses 22, 23, 24? Let me read for you. Colossians chapter 3, verse 22. It says, Slaves, obey your masters in everything. Not enough. Do it. Not only when their eyes are on you and to carry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Verse 23 here, it says now, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Verse 24, let's read it together in one voice. Since you know that, 
you receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Now, when we look at this passage, the first thing we've got to deal with here is slavery. Apostle Paul wrote this part of the scripture addressing to the church in Colossae, AD 60 to 61. He was telling the church in Colossae, he says, slaves, whatever your boss asks you to do, do it wholeheartedly, do it, obey it in everything. But what it seems objectionable, you call me slaves, and then I have to obey? What is this slave business in the Bible? Now, my friend, slavery in the New Testament time, or rather in the Greco-Roman history, was an acceptable institution. People become slaves for various reasons. Well, they were born to parents who were slaves. They sold themselves as slaves. And there were others who were prisoners of war. And then they became slaves. Then you'll be asking, why would someone sell themselves to become slaves? Well, at that time, to find employment, to be financially secure, people will sell themselves as slaves. Or they could be in a big debt that they couldn't clear. They would sell themselves as slaves. Rather to be financially secure, or it is good to be financially secure than to be a free-born poor. So that was the context whereby about this aspect of slavery. And then you'll be asking, slavery, and then this image that we have about slavery, about oppression, cruelty, it's dehumanizing, and then there's torture and all that stuff would come to our mind. Why didn't Paul condemn slavery? Now, at the peak of Roman Empire, it was estimated that nearly one-third of the working population were slaves. So slave, slavery was an acceptable institution, and people worked in the household as slaves. They were professionals, they were administrators, they were household managers, they were tutors, they were physicians. So it was a profession, but it's just that they have an owner and a master over them. Then the question here is this, why didn't the Scripture, why didn't the Bible condemn slavery? Now, my friends, you've got to understand this. The Christian faith there was new, establishing itself in the Roman Empire, in the Roman Kingdom. And then typical Roman household includes family, husband, wife, children, masters, and slaves. That all this relationship. And there were whole household that were won for the Christ, won for the Christ, won for Christ's kingdom. People come to know God. Now, if Paul were to wrote to say that we should take up arms and rise up and fight against slavery, then this newfound faith would be stamped out by the Roman Empire very soon and very quickly. Now, the author here, the Apostle Paul, in all his wisdom, inspired by the Holy Spirit, did something very wise. He wrote to the masters and then he wrote to the slave. He says, now that you have come to know the Lord, now that you have come to know Christ, the way how you relate to one another should change radically. Because of your Christian faith, how you relate to one another, how you serve, how you work should change radically. And it was because of that, that in God's divine wisdom, that rather to write to change the system, Paul write to change the human heart condition. And as the human heart condition changes, slavery will soon and very soon fade away. My friends, our concern will be to change our external circumstances. But God is saying, rather than changing the external circumstances, He wants to change our internal heart condition and circumstances. Some of you here, you are working, you feel trapped on a job. And you may be at a cusp of decision saying, should I change my job? Should I seek other profession? Now, my friends, before you make that decision this morning, perhaps it is rather a change of your external circumstances, but it is a change of your internal circumstances. I bring to you three important aspects about work, how to deal with our expectations, and how to be secure in our expectations. The truth here is this. Slaves and employee is an imperfect analogy. We are not slaves, 
we are free to move, change your job. But then the unchanging principles written here in the Bible is definitely going to help you to come to a decision about your life, career choice, and profession. The first thing here that we have to do is to work with the right attitude. Work with the right attitude. Verse 22, here it says now, Slaves, obey your masters in everything. And then what? Do it. Obedience. When you say that you obey, you do it. It's as simple as that. But some of us may be thinking it is so direct. How come never sugarcoat it? Give a sandwich model. So direct, the apostle says now, slaves, whatever your master says, obey them in everything and then you make sure you do it. And then all our friends here, you would have your question. Do it. Everything have to do it. What happens if my boss asks me to do something that is morally objectionable and morally questionable? Sounds harsh to obey everything and to do it. And then you have to understand that in that olden days, in the ancient Roman Empire time, slaves has no rights and positions. They were like tools and properties. Slaves were treated as a tool that can talk. Slaves were treated as a piece of property that can talk. So once that piece of property is no longer useful, you could just cast it aside. Slavery then, depending on who your master is, could be a dehumanizing. It was under this context that Paul says, slaves, no matter what condition that you are, no matter who your boss is, you obey, you submit to the authority, and then whatever has been asked to you, you do it. But that answer answered the question, what does it mean to obey in everything and to do it? Let me give you some helpful suggestion. They will help you to have a good understanding of what it means to obey in everything and to do it. Is it a matter of preference, convenience, or conscience? Preference, convenience, or conscience. If it's a matter of convenience, let your boss have the first say. A story was told of two engineers, told by their boss. He says, now, I want you to measure the height of the flagpole. Now, go and do it. So the engineers stand at the foot of the flagpole, staring up, scratching their head, and they were thinking, how should we go about measuring the height of the flagpole? And they were discussing, the engineers like to discuss the best approach, the solutions to the things on hand. So as they were discussing and talking about how to go about doing this, the boss came by. What are you all doing here? I just gave you a simple task. And then the boss said, look into the toolbox, got out a spanner, loosened up a few bolts and nuts, brought down the flagpole, went to the toolbox, took out a measuring tape, and then he measured the length of the flagpole. And then he told the engineer, see... 12.5 meters, dropped the measuring tape and went off. And one of the engineers looking at the other was shaking the shoulder and laughing. You know what? He was asking for the height and then he gave us the length. <laughs> preference, preference, preference. There are many ways to go about measuring the flagpole. In an instance where you're on a project, you are doing a feasibility studies. Of course, we as engineers or whatever profession that you are in, you do feasibility study. The best approach, the best way to go about it, the most cost-effective method. And then usually you come to your boss, you present your best approach. Cost savings, the best, only method. And your boss looks at the method and says, no, you, go, you do by my way, my method. And then many ways, many times we feel, whoa, how come you infringe on my professional advice? You feel so crossed and angry. Your boss don't value you. Now, if it's a matter of preference, there's many ways we can go about doing things. You let your boss have the first say. If it's a matter of convenience, go with your boss the extra mile. Have you ever come across a situation whereby you 
come into the, when your boss comes into the office and then he says, hey, I need the report. It is urgent. You know when your boss says urgent, what does it mean? He says it's immediately and then he wants it now. And then you hear yourself muttering under your breath in front of your keyboard and say, now, can't you see I'm busy? Can't you wait? You know, ever God is actually testing you, you know? God is trying to draw you out of your inconvenience so that you will serve your boss out of your inconvenience. If it's a matter of convenience, you go with your boss the extra mile. Then if it's a matter of conscience, then you need to stand your ground and say no. If it's a matter of conscience or it compromises your faith, then you know that you need to obey God rather than obey man and you need to say no. If you're asked to fudge a number to make the accounts look good and it compromises your faith, you don't feel that it's right. Or somehow rather you are asked to give sexual favours. Your boss oversees you, says, how about we go on this special work trip together between you and me? And after that, you'll be duly rewarded. And you know that the intention is not pure and it's not right. They've got to offer sexual favours. Or how about things that you do that compromises your faith? Then you know that you need to stand your ground and say no. Tell the person next to you, obey. Oh, hard right, obey. Very. It's a tough thing to obey. It is tough to obey. It's tough to submit. And all our friends here, if you are here new with us for the first time, you'll be thinking, this obedience thing, what is this? It, it, it isn't it like, you know, when we are in management, there's always this dominance and submission thingy. The corporate world outside is like, you must dominate. And when we hear about obedience and submission, we say it's like, this is weak stuff for weak people. Look on to the second part of the verse here and understand where God is trying to lead us. The second part of the verse here says this now. Uh, could I have Colossians 3.22? It says now, obey everything, do it. Then the later part says now, not only when their eyes on you to carry their favour, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Now, what does this carry their favour mean? If you read the new, uh, the NST version, what is the NST version? The new Singlish translation. The carry favour would mean angkat. Angkat means what? Carry your boss. Carry your boss. In a very colloquial sense. It says, carry your favour. NST translation. No, that's not NST translation. It's just a Singapore colloquial saying, angkat your boss. Now, what do people do outside the world? They will carry their favour so that to manipulate and to achieve their own objective and motives. But, this is what God is saying here. Now, you've got to please your boss. Not just a proper attitude, obedience, but then you've got to please your boss. Much more than that, with a sincerity of heart so that you gain the trust of your boss. It is the truth. You have to gain the trust and the favour of your boss, but not for a selfish motive or purpose, but so that in all the things that you do, you know that you're doing it all for God. Some of us are asking, you know, you don't understand. The environment that I work in is toxic. My boss is demanding, demeaning and dismissive. You never know the condition that I work in. It is tough. But 1 Peter 2.18 says this. Apostle Peter concurs with Apostle Paul. He says, now, slave, in your dealings, no, in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to the master's not only to those who are good and considerate, and also to those who are harsh. And that is the extent that the Bible talks about, this attitude of obedience. What relevance does it have for us? When we go to work, what do we expect? We expect good boss, true, we expect our boss to humor us, inspire us, and then treat us well. Yes? We expect our, co our colleagues to drop everything and come to help us when we need it. 
We have expectations on our job. We have expectations of our boss. But truth be told, our boss is imperfect. And our boss will somehow fall short of your expectation. Then the thing here is this. The scripture here is counter-cultural. Rather than saying, going to work, it says, what can you provide for me? Then the scripture is saying, God is encouraging all of us that you present yourself to God and says, this is what I can give to you, God. I present myself as a Christian employee that is trustworthy, that is to be trusted, and I will do what my boss says. Look at Titus 2, 9 to 10. He says, now, teach slaves. Now, Paul was writing to Titus. He says, now, in, in the Roman household, he says, teach slaves to subject to their masters in everything to try to please them, not to ding zui, talk back to them, and to show, and not to steal from them, and to show that you can be completely trusted. And more importantly, so that in every way, you will make the teachings of our God, our Saviour, attractive. And that's the key of everything. Why we serve, the work aspect, well, yes, we earn a living. But then the key here is we present ourselves at our workplace to our boss and say that, boss, I will do your bidding. I'm here to really serve you, do the best that I can. And then we can gain the trust of our boss and so that what? The good news of our God, our Saviour, can be heard. Not through what you say only, but through your deeds, through yourself. You are the testimony. So ask not what your boss can do, because we have no control how our boss would deal with us. But we have control how we present ourselves, how we live out our life at work and in approach to work. The right way to work is with the attitude of obedience. The attitude of obedience. Then it's carry on and it says in verse 23, you work with the right motive, you read with the right attitude, now you work with the right motive. You work with the right motivation. Verse 23 says this now, in whatever you do, Work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. So we talk about expectation on our boss, and now we talk about expectations that we have on the job. We all have expectations on the job. True, not true. And the thing here is we are sold on the modern idea that, you know, on the job, your career should help you to self-actualize. You should find fulfillment in your career. And it doesn't help when famous personality will tell you this. He says, now, when you look at yourself in a mirror and you don't feel passionate about your job, you should move away from your job. But if you think with me, in the ancient days, there is no self-actualization through career. There is even no career choice. If you are born... In a family of slaves, you'll be slaves. If your father is a farmer, you'll be a farmer. If your dad is a shepherd, you'll be a shepherd. Well, if you're so blessed and your dad is a king, provided you don't get assassinated and you survive, you'll be the king. Well, there isn't any career choice or even to speak self-actualization through our career. But we are always sold this idea here. You, know, you need to find a job that you are passionate about. You need to find a career that you can really fulfill your calling and yourself. And we are sold that idea. Not that it is wrong. It is not complete. Because we can go about our career, we fret about our career progression. When you get a career that you want, you fret about progression, prospect, advancement. And when you get that, you look for Rewards, remuneration, and promotion. But that's not a thing here. The scripture says in verse 22, whatever you do, you just work at it with all your heart because what? Your audience is not your boss. Your audience is God. 
Your target is not your boss. Your target is not because of the job that it brings you fulfillment. Your target is because it is, it is God that you are serving. Not for human master, but for a heavenly master. That that becomes our motivation when we come to serve Him. And then we'll be thinking about this, and we'll be asking this question. So motivation. What motivates us? What gets us going on the job? And once you know that it is not your choice of career that helps you to actualize, then you come to realize that perhaps there is much more to all these things that we have. Some of us here, you say, you know, I have limitations. I face limitations on my job. And when we get a job, we let our career define our self-identity. But the truth of the matter here, it is not your choice of career that defines who you are, but it is who you serve that defines who you are. Many of us here, the truth be told, not, many, not all of us here are CEO, high flyers, top management, where we all hold a, a normal job. Uh, we, are, we could be a sales assistant, an admin assistant. You could be a, a, a driver, a chauffeur, a cleaner. And then the truth about this career choice is this. We are many times underpaid, underappreciated, and we feel trapped in our job condition. And then, here is this encouragement that God wants to speak to you. You know, my friends, wherever your job condition, wherever you are working, that doesn't define you. That doesn't define you. When you work with the motivation that you are working for God, wherever you are doing, you will find that satisfaction and the fulfillment. Perhaps you are a sales assistant. You know, you, you attend to customers. Customers are tough to deal with, true or not true, especially Singapore customers, Singaporean customers, true or not true. I agree because why we like to complain, we criticize, you, we expect top-notch service for dirt cheap price. <laughs> and then here we serve customer, maybe you are a sales assistant and then you are selling shoes. Customer comes in, I want this one, give me this size, how about that one? bring me that size, I try this, try that, try this, try that, and then they never buy anything. <laughs> How about customers that are tough to deal with? Demanding. Maybe we are doing, we're working for call service, technical support. Customer calls in, usually nasty, bark at you, shout at you, but, because you're, but you're not a problem. The problem is not you, but you know, you become the target of their anger. And these are the things that we face. But then if you let your career, your profession define who you are, then you miss out the point that it is your motivation when you serve God that determines who you are as a person. And then when you serve a person or you serve a boss or you serve someone that is not worthy, then you feel short change. But then the greater, higher purpose is this, that when your motivation is to serve God, you know that Whatever I do, God sees, God appreciates. And then this motivation is not self-centered. This motivation is God-centered. I help you to see what I mean by motivations that are God-centered and motivations that are me-centered and man-centered. Be aware of the P, G, and V. Pride, guilt, and envy, sorry, it's E. Pride, guilt, and, and envy. Pride. When we serve for our own purpose or motive, pride always comes in. Why? I always want to be right. I want to be seen in the good light. And I don't want to be in the wrong. If that is your selfish motive, you always be serving out of pride. Or how about guilt? You made a mistake. You feel bad about it. You blame yourself. You feel angry about yourself. And that's where we serve out of guilt. Envy. 
and we all come out to work, we are peers, and somehow we feel like, hey, I, I serve God, I do all that I can, but somehow I see others, my peers, who are moving on, advancing, it seems like they're getting a better paycheck, a fatter paycheck, promotions after promotion, and I feel that I am languishing, envy. Pride, guilt, envy. Be aware of all these things. Now, recently, I, I got to deal with this aspect about motivations when we work. Now, company got a, got a job to supply our products, and then I was tasked to source for accessories. So my commercial manager, who deals with all the commercial aspects, he says, now, I'm going on long holiday, so the deal is more or less sealed. Now, your aspect is, deal with the technical aspect. Now, you're going to source for the accessories. Okay, technical specification comes in. I look at it, and then my manager says, now, this is my first option. Okay, go with this accessory. Safe bet. So my boss went for holiday, long holiday. So I'm left with, on my own, to deal with the decision. So then I looked at the technical specification and said, oh, I think this is what our customer needs and require. And this is our proposed option. I said, perhaps this doesn't meet. So I counter-proposed. I sourced and then I offer it to our customer. And I thought the deal was done. Until uh, two months back, or last month, I was overseas working. I told you I don't like working overseas, right? Because when you work overseas, right, you still got to deal with work back in the office. So I was working overseas. Then an email came in from my boss, director, above my manager. So my director came in with an email. He says, he called my name. He says, Yam, my surname. I said, what is this? Question mark, question mark, question mark, exclamation mark, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. And then a whole series of emails that I got to plow through because our consultant came in. Our consultant looked at my accessories that we are providing and then he says, whoa, this is not right. This is not going to work. And then he told my director, good luck to you if you go with this choice. My boss was concerned. So the email came in. Then after that, a barrage of SMSs, uh, WhatsApp came in from my commercial manager. Nasty. He says, hey, didn't I tell you to do what I told you to do? Go for this safe bet. Go for this option. And now we are in trouble. It's either we're going to cost overrun or we will delay the project. You know what? Marginally so thin. Now if you messed it up, we're not going to earn any money. Now, when I, when I get a barrage of uh, uh, all these accusations, then I will say I was very defensive. I was very angry. So how? Defend your position. Nah. <laughs> I'm correct. Consultant wrong. Nothing wrong with what, I've, what we have offered. It is correct, 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 correct. Then the more I say, it's correct, 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 correct. Then my manager says, it's not wrong, wrong, wrong. So, you know, I just took a step back and said, why am I so angry? No, we got to look at it objectively. Then I say, God, uh, would you help me, you know, ask for wisdom? So in my hotel room, I say, God, give me wisdom. I do not just want to defend my position and just insist that I'm right, but give me wisdom to resolve the problem. So I calm down, I still down, and because there are a way that I'm in my room. So I took out all the technical specifications. I, I re-looked at it, why I do what I do, and then I wrote back a brief back to the office without all the technical jargons so that my commercial manager could understand. So I sent it back in, email. My commercial manager received it, sent to our customer again to confirm and double confirm. So my customer says, yes, the offer that I suggested was acceptable, meets their requirement, actually it saves cost for them. Problem solved. No more email from my manager. And then things was, it is. Well, did I get a pat on the back? No. <laughs> because you're supposed to solve the problem. Right? You know, when you work, no problem, nobody says anything. True? 
When problem comes, accusation flies around. But I think here is if you are serving human masters, then there's always 101 reasons to walk away from the job and your boss and everything. But then I ask myself, if I'm serving God, then my motivation is not self-centered. But then I've got to ask myself, why do I get so angry and defensive? Now then I've got to check my heart condition. My friends, then my question for all of us is this. Do you serve out of a man-centered motivation or it is a God-centered motivation? Mind your pride, mind your guilt, mind your envy. Some of us here I've mentioned, you, you come out, maybe you are new into the working world, fresh, wide-eyed, idealistic. Then you look at yourself, you compare yourself with others. In church, perhaps, then you're serving God hard and then you feel that compared to your peers, they are advancing, I'm languishing. Check your motivation. If you do your best, you don't have to envy others. Because God sees your situation, He understands what you go through. Proper attitude, the right motivation. When you have the right attitude, it gets you started. The motivation gets you going. And now comes to the last part. It is to work with the right perspective. Because that will bring you to the end. That you see you right through the end. Verse 24 here, it says, Now work with the right perspective. He was telling them, Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. Another translation put it, you will receive a reward as an inheritance from God. If you read this passage, somehow you may not come to understand the full grasp of it. It is a paradox. Because if you're going to tell a slave that you receive an inheritance, it is a paradox in the Roman Empire in the olden days. Because slaves are not entitled to inheritance. Slaves have got no inheritance. Slaves has got no reward. But now here the Apostle Paul says, Now, slaves, you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. I've been asking myself, it is something tangible. Because why we work for something tangible, right? Promotion, reward, recognition. We, we look for something tangible. We look for promotion so that we have advancement. If no promotion, you know, pay increment is good. Lah, you know? Don't need the extra job, but give me the pay increment. These are the things, tangible things that we look for. How about give me a, a, a high-sounding job title? We look for the tangible things. But God is encouraging the people at the time. He says, now, my friend, if your earthly master do not reward you, you have a heavenly master above that rewards you. And it's not something tangible. And what is this inheritance as the Lord, as a reward? I'm going to show you a video testimony from this sister, Jolene. And then you listen to what she says. And I pray that God will bless your heart as you listen to this video testimony. Watch this video testimony. Amen. Thank you. Yeah, actually the first one year, it was a very um, good environment. We, we had a lot of time. We had work-life balance. But it was only when um, a crisis came and we were under a lot of scrutiny by external parties, auditors and so on, that things began to change. During that transition, the normal business as usual work was actually um, on quite a lot of me and my boss. It was a tough time because there was a lot of work, there was a lot of pressure and we often, you know, if we have to stay back late, we have to. I was given a certain destination and, and then as my new teammates joined, I realised then they were a lot uh, younger and yet they were higher positions and destinations than me, even though 
they didn't have an, as many years of experience. And I actually told my boss about this. She saw how my colleague and myself worked and she felt that we were unfairly compensated. We, they will correct this and they will correct it in the next promotion cycle. In April, after I came back from my first overseas trip and I came and saw in the email distribution list that there was a promotion list that came out and my name was not in there, I was concerned, I was puzzled and I was... Actually, I was shocked. I started to think, okay, maybe they have all been lying to me all this time. Was it uh, deliberate or did my uh, superiors actually didn't want to let me have the promotion? Because I look back, I was always doing well in school and I always worked very hard. And at the end of the day, however, when I went to university, I didn't, I didn't get a very good grade at the end of it. And sometimes I feel that I have let myself down. And the same for jobs. I've always worked very hard for every single one of my job, but yet every time I felt, you know, there wasn't any recognition, I would just move on. Or I felt that it was no use to stay in the place where I was because I wouldn't get the recognition, or I wouldn't be a, achieve where I want to be. Then I'll move on. And this was the last job that I have, and again it happened. I think it, it made me feel like very hopeless, like there was everything that I have done in my whole life was coming to naught and it was pointless. So during one of the worship sessions, uh, I, I went to God and I was very down, trodden. I really had, I was at my wit's end. So I prayed and I committed to God, I asked God, um, can you just take over from here? I'm very tired. I'm tired of striving and, and trying to on my own ways. If this is your will, you just take over and, and help me. And I think at that moment, I, I didn't really feel immediately, but I felt that um, I was given you know, permission to rest. I was, uh, I relaxed. I started to let go as I started to let go. I, I felt God was telling me it's all right. Everything is going to be all right, and just just rest. And during that time, that was all this bitterness and anger was building up. I was actually manifesting it. I was uh, shouting at my team a lot at the mistakes they made. I was venting my frustrations in the company in the daily life. I would apologize for what I did, and so that's what happened. I actually called my team together and I talked to them and I apologized for. The things that I did, like for shouting at them, for um, overreacting on some of the mistakes, and I promised to build them up. My boss actually came back later on and she said, she told me that they tried all kinds of means to get me uh, the promotion that they promised me, but it wasn't that they found out something along the way that actually the company had a policy that you have to work about three years before you can get promoted, and my time was not yet up. But at that time, I, when she told me all this, I I actually told her it's not important anymore. I think I realised then that the victory that God intended me to have was not in the promotions, was not in the overseas conference, was not in any increased pay or anything, but rather the victory was overcoming that bitterness and anger. And that was actually more important than anything else in the world. I just think that God, God's ways are higher than our ways. To me, I thought always that it was all the monetary rewards and man's recognition, but it is not. It is actually a transformation within myself. ...within ourselves. Now, Church, I want to say two things, a few things here. Some of our friends here, or even you may be thinking, now, does it mean that my career choice is not important to God? Or that I have to languish where I am, drift around and just make do with my career? Now, that's not what the Scripture is saying. But the scripture is saying, God is telling us here, if we always depend on the external circumstance, the promotion, the reward, a good boss, to determine your sense of worth and how hard you will work, you will always fall short of your expectation. And that's what the Bible is saying. That our identity, our sense of being is secure in God, in Christ, in Jesus. 
And there's another aspect here. Some of us here are bosses, right? You are maybe business owners, entrepreneurs. You are boss. You'll be thinking, hmm, good, good sermon. This is what I'm expecting of my employees. And then you go and measure up to your employees. Now, if you read the scripture, and I'll give you a broad perspective. The Apostle Paul spent 75% of his time addressing the slaves. And then he only spent 25% or nearly one, one short stanza. He was addressing the masters. Now, the truth be told, you as business owners, bosses, you have your pressures. And God understands the pressure. Yes, you have many things to consider on your mind. Whether the business is going to work, how are things going to be? You have your pressure. God understands that. But then God only, God gave slaves, employees, 75% of the instruction. But He gave you employers or bosses a very, very important instruction. It is to be fair to your employees. That's the thing that He says. The 75% are the things that hopefully, prayerfully, that you understand the voice of the employees. And then you will treasure them, be fair to them. And that's what God is asking of you as employers. Because why? You have a master in heaven. As, as much as you are an employee, you are a master so-called, you have a master in heaven over you. To all our friends here, you are here, you are in church for the first time, and then you hear this thing about submission, obedience. Motivation for God. What is this, man? I cannot understand. And then you talk about this God that you obey, this God that you serve and submit. I cannot understand. My friend, would you allow me to share the gospel, the good news with you? In all our obedience and submission, we do why we do because we believe that there is a Creator God. And that is the good news. We believe that there is a God and our submission is not to our earthly master. We believe that there is a God above that determines my destiny that I can be secure to serve wherever He puts me in. That's the good news. That there is a God this life that you have here on earth is not a rat race to the top. Or it's not just everything for yourself. We believe in a God, a creator. But because of sin, we are separated from God. What is sin? The Bible says that all men have sinned and fall short of the glory. All men have sinned and fall short of God's standard. What is sin? Well, do we get jealous of what other people have? Do we envy other people's achievement? Or we are angry, we show our anger just to get our way through. All these are sin, things that are not from God. And this Bible, this God that we believe, because of this sin, it separates us from God. Not just a physical separation, a spiritual separation. And the truth be told here, we all feel a gaping hole within us. This longing within us for something more, this longing within us that can only be filled by Jesus. And the, the thing here is, well, I would find means to meet that need. Success, achievement, attainment. But you know, my friend, you could have success without purpose, Achievement without contentment, attainment without fulfillment. Because why? We were made with that vacuum, with that God-shaped vacuum, that heart within us to come to know this Jesus. And Jesus came to bridge that separation, to bridge the gap between God and us. That Jesus came, as what the scripture says, that God so loved you and me, He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believed, shall not be condemned but have eternal life. Revelation 3.20 says this, I stand here, Jesus is here, and I knock at the door of your heart. And I knock at the door. If you hear my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with you and you with me. 
And you know what is that? Inheritance as a reward that we receive from God. It is the joy and the satisfaction and the fulfilment of coming to know this Jesus Christ in our life. The author, the perfecter of our faith. And that is the inheritance. God extends an invitation for all of us here. Whether you're here in church for the first time, you do not know this Jesus, but God extends this invitation for you to come to know Him. He says that if you open the door of your heart and let me in, I will have a meal with you. It talks about a fellowship, a reunion, a communion that is so satisfying, that is so fulfilling, that nothing of the material world could fulfill and satisfy. And that brings us and gives us a sense of security.